My name is Mikko and I am Finnish. From Finland indeed. Ten years ago, ten years ago, every single one of you had a Finnish phone. And today, none of you have a Finnish phone. <laughs> things move fast, things change fast. What happened in ten years? Well, exactly ten years ago, pretty much exactly ten years ago, Apple released iPhone. It was released in the summer of 2007. And then suddenly, we had the internet in our pockets, real internet. You could actually surf the web with your phone. And things are changing faster and faster. When you speak to people who are in their early 20s, some of the pe people in the audience are in their early 20s, people in their early 20s don't really remember the time before the internet. For them, the web has always been there. Google has always been there. Smartphones have always been around. And they think about the internet differently. They think about privacy differently. Because they've lived all their lives in a world where they pay for content with their privacy. They pay for content with data. They want to watch a video on YouTube, well, they have to let Google track them and so forth. And I believe we only have two big problems to solve. The problems of security and the problem of privacy. And yes, those are big problems, but they are different problems with different solutions. And it might be that we will not be able to solve the problem of privacy. We might have already lost the war on de defending our privacy because of internet. Internet. I have really mixed feelings about the internet. It's, it's great. I mean, we all love the internet. At the very same time, it's the perfect tool to erode our privacy. We are the first people in mankind's history whose whole life can be tracked thanks to internet and thanks to mobile phones. Our location can be tracked. Where are we? Where are we traveling? Who are we close to? What are we communicating about? Who are we communicating to? What are we interested in? Who we are? This can all now be tracked. This has never been, been possible before. So Apple shipped iPhone 10 years ago. And in doing that, they almost, almost killed Nokia. I'm glad they didn't. Nokia survived. Some people we're confident it's going to fold and go bankrupt, but it didn't. Nokia is now over 150 years old company, and it's once again profitable. But they changed from a provider of mobile phones to provider of telecom infrastructure. And people ask me about companies folding and going bankrupt after getting hacked. Because they have this, this notion that when companies get hacked really badly, um, they go bankrupt. And it doesn't happen. Yahoo was hacked really badly last summer, and they didn't go bankrupt. Sony Pictures was hacked really badly three years ago. They didn't go bankrupt. Companies actually don't fold just because they get hacked. I did actually a study on this, and I was able to find six companies that did go bankrupt or did fold or did end operations because they were hacked from all over the world. Only six examples of that happening. One of them, by the way, was... DigiNotar, the Dutch CA, which, uh, which folded five years ago because they were hacked by the Iranian government who was using them to issue SSL certificates for sites like gmail.com so they could monitor people inside Iran who were using Gmail for communications. And we believe that some of those people were jailed because of that, maybe even killed because of that. And when you think about what is a CA doing, a certificate authority, what are they actually selling? Well, they're selling text files. I mean, that's what, a, what an SSL certificate is. They're selling nothing. Basically, they're selling trust. That's what they're selling. And DigiNotar did not fold because they were hacked. They folded because they were hacked and they didn't tell anyone. And when that happens, you lose trust. And if that's the only thing you're selling, then you deserve to fold. But Yahoo didn't go bankrupt. I, I think one of the biggest surprises about the Yahoo hack 
was that uh, they lost over a billion user accounts. How the hell does Yahoo still have a billion users? <laughs> so, how expensive was the Yahoo hack? That's a good question, especially because we have an answer for it. Typically, we don't actually, we, we, we aren't able to put a money figure on, on hacks. But Yahoo was in the middle of negotiations of being acquired by Verizon. And they had to drop the price by $350 million just because they were hacked. The only reason they dropped the price was that they were hacked. $350 million. That's a lot of money. So who caused this damage? Who's f who, who was responsible for this $350 million drop? Who did it? Well, this guy did it. This is uh, Karim Baratov, a, uh, a Russian hacker living in Toronto, currently arrested in Toronto, waiting extradition to the United States to, be, um, to go to trial for the Yahoo hack, together with his partners in crime, um, especially a guy called Alexei, another Russian hacker. And by the way, not all the hackers are Russian. All right? Not all of them are Russian, because some of them are from Ukraine. <laughs> and whenever we investigate crime cases, um, one thing we try to do is that we try to find the social media footprint of the suspects. Because everybody is on Facebook. Even the criminals are on Facebook. So they have, they have accounts, they have an Instagram. Here's Karim's Instagram, which is mostly about partying and pretty girls. But he, he has quite a bit of coverage online about his hobbies. And his hobby is cars. That's his Mercedes. That's his Aston Martin. Here's a photo from his Instagram about car keys. Two Mercedes, one Lambo, a Rolex, and a Maserati. That's a nice collection. And here's a picture from his yard. That is a goddamn Rolls Royce right there. So crime pays, right? Until you get caught. He was caught. He's wedding extradition. He's no longer enjoying his cars. He probably will not be enjoying them for quite a while. So what's... What's the mechanism of, of um, converting stolen accounts into Rolls Royces? Well, there's multiple different ways. Data, well, you've heard the saying, data is the new oil. And this is actually, I, I like this saying for many reasons, because oil is very valuable and data is very valuable. But when you pump oil out of the ground, when it's crude oil, you can't do anything with it. It's valuable, but you can't do anything with it until you refine it. Exactly the same thing applies to data. Raw data, it's valuable, but you can't do anything with it. You have to refine it. You have to mine it. You have to search for the important information to build profiles and things like that. And just like oil has brought us a lot of prosperity and a lot of problems, data will bring us a lot of prosperity and a lot of problems. And one thing which we run into all the time in our line of work is criminals who are moving their money around in Bitcoin. We see this a lot. Bitcoin is the mega trend behind ransom attacks, including ransom trojans and companies getting hit by denial of service attacks. And then the attackers mail them and tell them that they will stop the attacks if they get a couple of Bitcoin as a ransom. Or we get companies hacked and their data stolen. And then they are told that this data leak will, will be made public until a ransom is paid in Bitcoin. So does this mean that Bitcoin is bad? Well, no, it doesn't. It means that Bitcoin is a tool, just like cash is a tool. Cash isn't good or bad, it's a tool. Bitcoins or any cryptocurrencies aren't bad or good, they're just tools. But they do enable the criminals to move their money around without getting caught. And one of the interesting things about the history of, of Bitcoin and blockchain is, is that we don't know who invented it. I once saw a t-shirt which said that Satoshi Nakamoto died for our sins. I like that. I actually don't believe that Satoshi Nakamoto exists. I don't think there is a person to be found. But whoever he is, he is a great innovator. 
In fact, I like blockchain as an innovation even more than Bitcoin, which was built on top of it. Blockchain is one of those innovations which seems obvious once it was invented. That's a, that's a sign of a great invention. Like once somebody invents it, it's obvious. But it wasn't obvious until someone invented it. But the idea of having a distributed database, a distributed database of, of transactions, and those transactions are locked into place so that they can never be changed. And it's a public database, so it's a public record of transactions which can never be changed. That can be used to do lots of things, including a cryptocurrency. Or if you look at things like Ethereum, you can build contracts, smart contracts on top of blockchain. But one of the innovations that I thought I, I liked, I'm not sure if it really makes sense or not, but I, I think it's a great example uh, to, to, to explain to laymen on, on what you can do with blockchain, was this thing that I read about from Bosch. Bosch, the car electronics company. Because they are fighting odometer fraud. Like you sell your car and the dealer rolls back the odometer in your car and sells it with a better price. Well, they now have a prototype of an odometer blockchain. So the cars will send their kilometer uh, numbers once a week to a blockchain where they are locked into place. And it's a public blockchain. Anybody can check how many kilometers has been driven in any of the cars using the blockchain. And if I understood it correctly, it's actually the cars themselves maintaining the blockchain, which is perfect because you want the infrastructure to be there as long as the cars are there. So, you know, in 30, in 40 years, there will still be cars using this service. And the cars themselves maintain the blockchain. I mean, as long as you have two cars left, they will maintain the blockchain for each other. It's, it's a pretty nice scenario. But the examples of things that we see happening with, uh, with these ransom attacks will change. I mean, companies get hacked, their data is stolen, and they get contacted by criminals asking for Bitcoin to to uh, give the data back, for example. And right now, the criminals don't seem to know how much they should be asking. Because the, the, the amount they're asking is all over the place. They might be asking for one Bitcoin, which is 1,100 euros, or 100 Bitcoins. I mean, they, I mean, they, they, they don't actually know how much the data is worth. And this will change next May. Next May, they will know how much to ask. Why? What's going to happen next May? Well, next May, we get the EU General Data Protection Regulation into place. And GDPR, which comes into effect next May, regulates that if a company loses customer information and it hasn't taken proper, core, uh, proper care of that information, EU can fine them up to 4% of their global revenue. And this is a price level. I'm forecasting that we will start seeing attacks where a company gets hacked, their customer data is stolen, and then they get contacted by the criminals saying, hi, we lost your data and we will leak it, we will make this public, unless you pay us 2% of your global revenue. <laughs> right? It's going to happen. GDPR is going to set the price level for online crime. Another thing which is Changing very quickly around us right now is IoT. IoT. The abbreviation IoT, the S in IoT stands for security. <laughs> I stole that from someone, it wasn't my idea. But it's, it's very true. Well, it's actually more complicated than that. Yes, there are problems with devices, like this Miele dishwasher has a uh, web server directory traversal bug. I mean, you could just, you know, connect to the web server on your dishwasher and ask for the shadow password file. I mean, let me repeat that sentence. Connect to the web server in your dishwasher. <laughs> and one of the problems we have in, in this, well, we have two different problems with IoT. One of them is, is, is vulnerabilities like this, which are similar as you would have in any other system, vulnerabilities. And then we have users who don't configure their new devices. And this is a problem which isn't new. 
let's go back to 1980s. Every home in 1980s had one of these. This is a VHS tape player. You watch videos from it. This is the Netflix of 1980s. <laughs> and every home would have one of these in the living room. In the living room, they would have a big TV, and then they would have a VHS player underneath it. And whenever you would go to your friend's house, they would have a big TV and a VHS player. And every single one of those VHS players was displaying the same thing on the display. Every single one of them was displaying a blinking 12 o'clock. <laughs> Why? Because when you boot up the player, it doesn't know what time it is, and it's expecting you to go and read the manual. Because on page 81 in the manual, they will explain to you how to set the time. And we never did that. Nobody ever did that. <laughs> and this is the same problem as we have with our IoT devices. Because what we do with our IoT devices is this. We go and buy an IoT, I don't know, IoT security camera. We bring it home. We unbox it. We put it on the wall. We take our smartphone out and we install the app. And then we pair the app with the camera. And we configure it and, and we get the video. It works. It works. It works. Don't change anything. Don't change anything. It works. Don't change the password. That's what we do. Which is exactly the same problem as we have here. So is there a way of doing this right? Well, yes, and we have a great example, a little bit surprisingly, a great example from IKEA. A friend of mine bought an IKEA Trodfree lamp, which is an IKEA IoT lamp system. And he was chuckling to himself, that, oh, this is going to be horrible, let me, let me see how it works. And he actually looked into it. There's a smartphone app through which you can you know, turn off your lights and stuff like that. And it was actually done very well. It's not running some three kernel versions old Linux. It's running a real-time operating system, which is running no services, has no open TCP ports, listens to one UDP port. Everything is authenticated. Code updates are signed. This is done right. Great. I mean, it's a great example. IKEA is leading the way of implementing secure IoT. <laughs> Why is IKEA, of all companies, doing this? Well, IKEA makes their money by selling huge amounts of devices. Their margins are very small. The products are cheap, so the margins are very small, but they make the money because they sell millions of them. And the worst thing that could happen to them is a product recall. That's what they're trying to avoid. You know, whatever they do, they try to avoid recalls. They don't have to make a lot of money out of one product. They're going to sell a lot of them. But if they have to do a recall, it's going to kill the whole model. And this is why they are investing money into security, which is great. But one thing does worry me about IoT devices, which is that all these dishwashers and lamps and whatever we are plugging into the internet, they connect to some service somewhere, typically you know, some AWS installation somewhere. And those cloud systems won't be there forever. The cloud backends won't run forever. And when you buy a washing machine, you expect you'll be able to use it for, I don't know, 10, 20, 25 years maybe, if it's a good dishwasher. You buy a car, you expect to run, I don't know, 20, 30 years. I'm, I'm running a, an 18-year-old car right now. But in the future, will they, will they still be getting updates 20 years in the future? Patches, security fixes, will the cloud backend be running? Great questions. And how will they fail when the cloud is no longer there? One example we saw recently was when we had an S3 outage with AWS, and some people were reporting that they couldn't turn off their oven. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty bad, isn't it? But we have hope. Of all companies, IKEA is giving us hope. And our work, those of us who work with computer security, our work has never been more important. I'm a computer security guy. I've been a computer security guy all my life. And all my life I thought, I thought that my job is to secure these. Like this is a computer, I'm a computer security guy, my job is to secure computers. Well, that's not my job and that's not your job. Because everything 
runs on computers. Everything runs on computers and software. Every company is a software company. And your job is not to secure computers. Your job is to secure the society. Thank you for doing your work. Thank you.